What is up everyone, Nick here, and in today's video, I'm going to be taking you guys through the process of building my latest 3D printed Iron Man suit, the Mark 46. Specifically, we're going to be covering the brand new electronics I've installed in the suit, as well as how I built the arms. And make sure you stay tuned till the very end of this video where I cover how I actually put on the Iron Man suit by myself. Just to quickly recap, since I've already covered the majority of this suit in my previous videos, which I highly recommend you guys go check out, wink wink, nudge nudge. Earlier this year, I finally started working on a brand new 3D printed Iron Man suit. The files for the Mark 46 armor were by Johan 3D Printmaster. And once I got my hands on the files, I made a bunch of modifications to the legs to improve the mobility. And once I had the files scaled just right, I commissioned my friend Levy 3D to make a bunch of modifications to the actual suit. Namely, the modifications were to help putting on the suit and to also motorize the suit. And once it came to the actual 3D printing, I had this suit 3D printed in Sunlu PLA Plus. And I gotta say, these prints came out beautifully. And I haven't had any issues with the filament itself, no clogs, no under extrusion, nothing like that. The prints just came out phenomenally. And I really wanna thank Sunlu for sponsoring this project. They sent over 15 kilograms of their PLA Plus for me to print out this suit. And I have to say with all the modifications I made to the suit, I had to do a lot of prototyping and that means that a lot of filament went to waste. So none of this would be possible without Sunlu's support. So thank you very much. But now that we're all on the same page, let me take off the suit and let's check out those new PCBs that we're going to be using to motorize the chest and the back. Okay, how about we open up this, voila. Oh, it's just styrofoam. <laughs> Empty box, toss this aside. Got ourselves another pen, some stickers, and we have all of our PCBs that we're going to be using for the chest and for the back motorization. Before I start covering the details of this PCB, I've been holding out on you guys. For the past few projects I've done with PCBWay, they've been sending me some extra stuff. Namely, they've continued to send me rulers. And I mean, a lot of rulers. <laughs> so I now have pink, I have black, I have a blue one, I have an orangish yellow one, I have two white ones, and I have two purple ones that are slightly different from one another. And I love them. They're just very practical to have. They're very small, so I keep them pretty much everywhere in the workshop, so I always have a ruler nearby that I can grab to measure stuff. Anyways, little ruler tangent aside, let's get back to the PCBs. Awesome. Boom, did it. Trash. So these are essentially the 2.0 version of the PCBs I originally designed for the chest motorization. They have quite a few improvements as well as some extra features. So instead of using JST PH connectors, which are fairly small, I decided to upgrade to XH connectors, which are slightly bigger. They're the same connectors that are used on Crashworks boards. One change that I'm so glad I did is I changed the connector for the power input. Instead of being a JST PH connector like on the old one and having to modify a wire, it's now a USB micro type B connector. So that means that I don't have to splice any wires. I could just buy a USB micro type B and plug it right into the board and have power. And the second change I decided to implement with this board was recommended by a user in the comments of the last chess motorization video and that is I added a capacitor for the power. It basically works as a mini battery for the board. If there's a huge draw of power because let's say all the eight servos are working at the same time, power will be drawn from the capacitor and should keep everything running properly instead of having dips in voltage and having the Arduino reset. One other thing I decided to add because I'll be using this for the back ailerons is two outputs to control the smoke machines. And on top of that, I also added two pins for the eyes just in case I want to light anything up using the I function. And lastly, I added a sound module. So you have two connections going from the DF player to the Arduino from the TX and RX pin for serial communication. You have another two wires going to your speaker. And lastly, the only other thing that you need to get this to work with the Crashworks code is an SD card with the MP3 sounds uploaded to it. And the cherry on top of this whole thing is I added a Mark 46 to the back of the PCB just to be extra cool. Because if you didn't know it already, coolness improves the effectiveness of a PCB by at least 10%. So the very first order of business with this PCB is not going to be the through hole connectors that we need to solder. It's actually going to be the tiny resistor that goes right here. It's a surface mount resistor. So instead of using a soldering iron like we usually do, we're going to be using solder paste in a very hot element. So in this case, I'm just going to be using my heat gun because that's all I have, but it should do the trick. So the way I understand it is soldering paste contains microscopic beads of solder, all suspended 
suspended in some sort of gel and the solder as it starts melting sucks up whatever surface mounted element you have into its correct position. And here we have our final product. So it's nothing too crazy. It's literally a breakout board for the Arduino Nano and for the DF Robot MP3 player. So we have a bunch of JST XH connectors for the servos, the NeoPixels and all of that. And then we have our USB micro B connector for the power. We have a capacitor and we have the pin headers for both of those boards. And you might've noticed, if not, you should be paying attention to the video and you should also hit that subscribe button while you're at it. But this board is going to serve as a breakout board for a DF Robot MP3 player, which means we're going to be able to play sounds. Now I should really take the time to thank Crashworks 3D for putting in the time and the effort to designing such a code because without the Crashworks code, none of this would be really possible because I'm kind of illiterate when it comes to coding. And the Crashworks code is what's going to allow us to play those sound effects because not only is the hardware side super easy to configure, but the software is too. Now, speaking of hardware, this right here is the DF Robot MP3 player. And these things are basically foolproof. There's no coding on this end. All the coding is going to be done on the Arduino Nano. The only thing we need to configure are the sound effects on this SD card, which slots in right there. And there are a bunch of pins on the back of this, but we're only going to be using six of them. The first two is going to be pretty obvious. We're going to need power and we're gonna need a ground to get power to this board. And the other two are going to be for the serial communication. So one of them is going to be the serial transmitter, which is going to transmit to the serial receiver on the Arduino Nano. And the other one is going to be the serial receiver, which is going to receive serial communication from the transmitter on the Arduino. And then we're going to have two more pins, which is going to be for the speaker. And that's it. We only need six pins on this board to get it to work with the Crashworks code. So before we get started with the modifications I made to the config file and to the code to get everything to work, I might as well show you guys what it's gonna look like. So we're gonna plug in our DF Robot MP3 player into the board. We're going to plug in our Arduino Nano into the board as well. We're also going to plug in the speaker right here. And we're also going to be plugging in some NeoPixels into the board because I slightly modified the code to run NeoPixels. And if I just grab a cable for power, so I'm gonna plug this in right here and I'm gonna plug in the battery right here. Both lights just turned on on the board and we should start hearing sound now. And then of course we have the Crashworks Jarvis boot up. And to turn this on, I'm literally just gonna use a set of pliers to make contact between the pins because I haven't wired up a button yet, but just like so, sound works and we have the NeoPixels that are on. And if I press it again, sound and the NeoPixels turn off. The sound effects that just played on this board are not the traditional Crashworks 3D helmet sound effects. I programmed my own because this specific setup is going to be in the back of my suit for the back flaps for the ailerons. So the yellow lights are going to simulate the jets and the sound effects are simulating the suit flying off and landing. So I'm gonna move all this aside and we're gonna focus on the coding. Has it become obvious yet that I record these on like different days? No? Good. So what we're gonna do is jump on the computer and we're going to open up the Crashworks 3D folder that we've downloaded from the GitHub. If you haven't done that yet, I'll leave a link in the description to the GitHub page to where you can download it. And we're going to open up the config file. So I created a brand new folder with the Crashworks code in it called Chess Motorization Crashworks. That way I don't get confused with which is which. So I'm gonna go to Iron Man Servo. There's the library folder, there's the config.h file, and there's the ironmanservo.ino code, which is for Arduino. So right off the bat, we're gonna go to the very first line in the config file, and we're gonna enable sound. So you're gonna see this line, uncomment this line to enable sound for the SU expansion board. So in this case, it's going to be the DF Robot MP3 player. So you can already see I've already uncommented it. This means that I got rid of these two little lines right here, so we're gonna get rid of that and then we're gonna keep scrolling. We don't wanna uncomment the Walsh 3D Mark 85 file because that's gonna mess up with our modifications. Same thing for the missile stuff, we don't wanna mess with it. What we do wanna modify here is the define MP3 type DF player. We want to uncomment that to enable the DF player. I know, it's obvious. Now volume, I modified it to 30 for max volume. Now this is where it gets interesting. We're gonna go down to declare pin settings and this is where we're gonna do the bulk of our modifications. So as you can see in the config file, I've added all these servo pins. So normally on an Arduino Nano, you have one side that is digital 
pins and you have another side that is analog pins. But since we already have so many pins used up for the digital side, for like the eyes and the button and stuff like that, we're actually gonna use some of these analog pins as digital pins because they actually can be used as digital pins. So from analog zero to analog five, we're gonna use all six of those pins as digital pins. And now we need to define the open position and the closed position for all the new servos we just added. Whatever you're repurposing this code for, I recommend just setting all of this to zero for now for the angle and testing it later once everything is built out. Also, one other recommendation, do not install the servo arms onto the servos once everything is built out. Just install the servo in place, run your code, and check what direction the servo goes in because it might go in the wrong direction than you actually intended. And that'll just keep you from breaking anything. And once you've figured out which direction it goes in, you can modify the config file, save it, re-upload the sketch onto your Arduino Nano, and then you can keep testing until you have the perfect servo directions, the perfect servo angles for all of your servos in your project. So right here, we have disable servo after open set to true. Personally, what I ended up doing since I wanted different servos to be enabled and disabled after opening and closing, I did the bulk of those modifications in the actual code. I didn't really mess around with the config file for this. Now we have the button pin, we have the left eye pin, the right eye pin, and then we have all of this auxiliary stuff that we're just not gonna mess around with because we're not using this particular part of the code. And then at the very bottom of the config file, we have all of the different effects settings for the eyes when it opens and closes, how they turn on and whatnot. But again, we're not gonna be messing around with that. We just want to mess around with the servos. So once you've saved the config file, we can finally open up the ironmanservo.ino file for Arduino. Once this is open, we can start scrolling down. You'll see it says hashtag include config so that means that the config file will be implemented into the code and make the necessary modifications now here's where it gets interesting i added a bunch of stuff to enable neopixels so the first line you're going to see here is hashtag include Adafruit Neopixel.h. So this is the Adafruit Neopixel library. If you don't have it enabled in Arduino IDE, you can just go to tools, manage libraries. This will open up and you can type Adafruit Neopixels and it should pop up right here. And as you can see, I've already downloaded it. And then you're also going to add which pin you want the Adafruit Neopixel to be associated with. And in this case, I associated it with digital pin four in my code. And next up, we need to tell the code how many Neopixels are associated to that pin. So in this case, it's 60, but you can add less, you can add more. And then we also need to tell the code which colors we want the Neopixels to be. So in this case, I have red set to 70. I have green set to 40 and I have blue set to zero. So this is gonna give us a nice yellow. Now, if I keep scrolling, you're going to see these sound effects more on that later. We're not gonna be messing around with these. We're just going to be modifying the SD card. Most of this code, we're not gonna be messing around with. We just need to go to the faceplate up and faceplate down cases. So right here, this is a line that we need to modify. This is void faceplate open. So this is all the code that's going to run when the faceplate is supposed to be opening. So the very first line of code I added to this is this block of text right here. This is for the NeoPixels. This is going to turn on the NeoPixels. So if the servo is detached and it's not in the correct position, the servo attach command is going to reattach it and it's going to place it in the closed position before actually opening. Now you'll notice I have servo three, four, five, six, and seven and eight attached. The reason why I did this is while I was testing originally with the old PCB board, sometimes if I had all eight servos attached at the same time, the Arduino would reset. So I decided to have a few of them attach and a few of them move and then have the top panel attach and move. So all six of these servos attach at once. And then we have the servo write command. So the write command is going to tell the servo what to do. In this case, servo three dot right, servo three open position. So it's going to go into the open position. And then right here, I removed the speed and installed my own speed. I added a sim delay command of 200 milliseconds. So we have the two side panels that open up. There's a 200 millisecond delay and then servo seven and servo eight for the bottom panel are activated. And in this case, they actually go slightly slower than the two top panels they go at 350. And then we have another sim delay command of 350 milliseconds. And then finally the top panel can move. So servo seven and servo eight detach because they don't need to be attached to stay in place. 
Servo 1 and Servo 2 attach, so that means they're activated. There's another delay of 600 milliseconds, and then Servo 1 and Servo 2 can move into the correct position. I added another SIM delay, and then Servo 1 and Servo 2 can detach because the servos I choose for the top panel are not MG90S servos, the exact same size as MG90 servos, but they have higher torque, which means the top panel can stay in position while being detached. And then there's another SIM delay command to wait for all the servos to go into their proper position before faceplate close can be activated. Now I'm just gonna go quickly through void faceplate close because it's basically more of the same that I just explained. In this case, servo seven and servo eight go at 400 speed, and then there's a one second delay, and then three, four, and five, and six close at the exact same time, and they go really, really quickly. And then there's another SIM delay of 500 milliseconds, and then server one and servo two can close. And then at the very end of all this code, I have these lines of code, which turn off the NeoPixels. So it says strip set pixel color to 60, zero, 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 strip clear, and then strip show, which means it'll show whatever settings I just added. And that should turn off the NeoPixels. And that pretty much covers all the modifications that I made to the code itself for the chest motorization. If I wanted to do something like the back flaps, I would do something very, very similar to this, but I would add even more SIM delay commands. That way I can have the servos stagger. So that means that the ailerons look like they're stabilizing. And now we can finally talk about the MP3 files. So when it comes to the chest motorization and the sound effects I want, for it, I think I'm going to keep the Crashworks 3D sound effect for it closing, but for opening, instead of having the sound, I'm actually going to use some sound effects from the first Iron Man movie. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to YouTube, I'm going to find the Iron Man Mark II suit up sequence, and I'm going to download it as an MP3. And in the meantime, I'm going to download Audacity. It's an open source audio software editor. So once I've opened up Audacity, I can just drop the MP3 that I've just downloaded into it and you'll see this giant blue bar. So this is all of the sound from the scene we just downloaded. So I quite literally just want this. Maybe the drill too, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I'm going to skip the drill sound effect when he's doing his arm and I'm just gonna do that first chunk of the sound. I'm gonna click right there and I'm going to right click and split the clip. Now I can delete this front end, click on cut, drag this forward right there and then go, where does it end? I'm gonna go right there and split it again, and I'm gonna delete the rest of this audio because I really don't need it. So we're going to end up with one clean sound effect. Not too much music playing in the background, which is perfectly fine. Now, what I do wanna mess around with a little bit is the sound, like in terms of how loud it is. So I'm gonna go to volume and compression and click on amplify and apply. Now it's gonna increase the sound by quite a bit. It's loud now. Now, what I don't like about this is how abrupt it ends. So I'm gonna click on this little tool right here, the envelope tool, and I'm just gonna add these dots to the uh, sound. Now, basically I'm adding a curve to it, so it's going to fade out near the end of the audio. So if I just move these around, I should be able to get it to where I like it. Uh, that's not bad. Okay, so I think what I'm gonna do is stretch out the audio ever so slightly. That way we have more room to play around with. And I'm gonna keep adding these dots until it's a nice fade. Because, oh no, don't move that. Because right now it kind of ends abruptly and I don't want that, especially if the sound is gonna be so loud. I don't want it to just cut out super abruptly. It's not gonna be nice on the ears. That works, see, that's exactly what I'm looking for, perfect. So now I'm gonna grab the SD card. Now, if you haven't done it already, I recommend getting yourself an SD card and uploading all the MP3 files from the MP3 folder in the Crashworks 3D folder. So there should be like seven files in total and the one we're going to be replacing this one with is 0003 because 0001 is the closing sound effect and 0003 is the opening sound effect. And I'm gonna take my micro SD with all the sound effects preloaded onto it. I'm gonna plug it right in. It should load up on my computer, that's perfect. Now I'm going to go to File, 
export audio and you wanna make sure that we have these settings installed. So we have mono because we're just using one speaker. Um, we have the correct uh, sample rate and whatnot. And we're going to rename the file 0003 and we want it to upload to our SD card folder. And once all of this is set up, we can export and it's going to tell us that that file already exists on the SD card. Yes, we want to replace it. Plug it back into the DF player and we can turn it on. First, I'm just gonna plug in a speaker so we can actually hear it. Uh, speaker goes right there. I got my battery right here. I'm gonna plug it right in. Now everything's booting up and we should get the Crashworks sound effect. Boom, we get our own sound effects. So this is gonna go for the chest and for the back ailerons, what I'm gonna do is use the sound effects from the Mark II testing scene where he's figuring out how to fly with the boosters on his boots and his gauntlets. So I'm gonna take the sound effect of him taking off and I'm gonna take the sound effect of him landing. So the electronics all work. All we need to do is install it in the suit. I don't have a better transition for this, so arms. So I'll be using inspiration from Frankly Built and his method of attaching the arms to the suit in his Starboost armor. So I'm going to be using these. These are heavy duty retractable keychains and I'll be mounting two of them in each shoulder to be able to retract the arms. So that way I should be able to put on the suit by myself without any help in theory, but we'll see if that actually works. But to mount these in the Mark 46, I decided to design my very own mounts for them. So it looks something like this. So this piece right here is kind of the cover of the shoulder missile pods. I slightly modify them so that the missiles and the cover are all one piece. So this is a friction fit in the shoulder. And underneath this part, I designed slots so that I could feed in these plastic bits from the retractable keychains. And on the other side, I have friction fit mounts for the retractable keychains in the shoulder. So they look something like this. This was designed in 3D Builder. It's literally just two slots that perfectly fit in the retractable keychains. And this used to be like a giant rectangle like this, but using the subtract tool, I was able to make a cutout for the shoulder. So you have all these detail lines that perfectly correspond with the shoulder piece. So this glues perfectly in place. Instead of trying to glue a flat surface into a curve and only have certain edges making contact with the part, this entire surface area of the mount is making contact with the shoulder. So all of this is glued into the shoulder. So honestly, I don't see this breaking off anytime soon. Okay, little bit of a time jump. So basically I ran into a few issues when it came to the arms. And again, this is why I always say that whenever you're testing something, do not test it in a vacuum. Test it with the rest of the equipment you're going to be using. For example, the arms I had printed earlier in the video worked fine on their own. I could put them on, they fit comfortably, they moved around perfectly, it was fine. But as soon as I rigged it to the shoulder and rigged the shoulder to the rest of the torso, everything got out of whack. The biceps would collide with the torso, which would make the arms sag slightly lower, and the wrist portion of the forearm would be basically over my thumb. It was ridiculous. And on top of that, it was just really uncomfortable around the armpit areas, and as the arms would sag, it would pull on the shoulder, and there'd be a giant seam where the shoulder should meet the torso. So I went back to the drawing board, and I started rescaling the arms. I started with the biceps, and I made them slightly bigger on the X and Y axis. I didn't change the height, the height is fine. And and instead of dremeling out this section of the armpit area and around the elbow so that it wouldn't pinch my armpit, I guess? No, elbow pit? I don't know. Point is, instead of dremeling all this out, I decided to go back into Blender and make those cuts in Blender. So I made a bunch more room around the armpit area and I made this transition along the elbow a lot smoother. That way I don't pinch myself accidentally. Also, I should add that I got really lucky when it came to the double hinge on the elbow. I imported the files into 3D Builder and I clicked on separate objects and that separated the hinge system from the actual arm, which meant I could scale this however I wanted to and then refuse it all back together without changing any of the proportions for the hinge. So one other thing I decided to do for the arms is shorten the forearm. So now it's quite a bit shorter. I think I reduced it by like two, maybe even three centimeters. And on top of that, I decided to fuse this inner arm panel. Number one, there's not gonna be any crazy electronics inside the forearm that I need to sort out, like on the Mark 20 with the lasers and the missile launcher. At most, there's going to be a light on the forearm and there's also going to be a battery pack to power everything. And on top of that, 
the hole around the wrist is quite wide, so whenever I do put the arm on, my hand slips through without any issues. And with the old set of arms, I had it sitting super high up on my arm, so whenever there was like some sort of torsion around the armpit, it would automatically sit down. So now the arm naturally sits in this position, which is exactly where it needs to be for my wrist now that we've shortened the forearm. And even if I move my arm around and it collides with the body, it's not gonna get any lower than this. It's gonna stay here, as opposed to being here and sliding all the way down like this. And once I 3D printed the entirety of the arm, I just repurposed the hinges from the old arm into this one, added some new threaded inserts, and assembled everything, and it works perfectly fine. And one other thing I went ahead and did is added a buckle on the top of the bicep right here, which buckles into the shoulder. Now let me grab the entirety of the torso right here. There we go. Ta-da! We can just, whoa, attach this right there. And there you have it. <laughs> But now that we've covered the arms, I will be showing you guys what's going on on the inside of the torso now that I have all the new electronics installed. Ah, there we go, there we go. So let me sit this aside for now and let me put this right here. So it's nothing too complicated on the inside of the back. We have the battery pack right here. We have the USB cable right here to plug into the battery, which leads to this 3D printed case right here, which is Velcroed into the back. And in terms of wiring, there's not a whole lot going on here. We have the USB cable, just like I mentioned. We have four wires here for the four servos for the ailerons and we have this little speaker glued right into place. Everything else is inside this little case. So we have the PCB connected to the Arduino. We have the WEMOS D1 mini board for the wireless communication. And there will be some more electronics in the back soon. I still have to build the new fog machines and make a video for how to build those fog machines. They'll, they'll be coming in 2024, I promise. Same thing for the wireless control boards. But yeah, not a whole lot going on here, which is just how I like it. This means that there's way less points of failure for things to go wrong and there's a lot less to set up, a lot less to configure. So if anything does go wrong or bugs out, it's really easy to diagnose and to fix. And this whole setup right here is very similar to what we have in the chest. I've already talked at length about the chest motorization in the last video. The only difference is there's four extra servos inside this. So I'm gonna set this aside and we're gonna start suiting up. Now let's see if I can put this back on. That's the other arm. You go there. You go there. There we go. Awesome. Okay, the suit's back on. Nice. If I grab this and I open it up again, which button is which? So the second button is for the back flaps. Hopefully you guys can hear the sound with the mic in front of me. Oh yeah. And then for the chest. This is really cool. <laughs> I'm impressed with myself. Now let's see if I can put my own arc reactor in. Not really, huh? Okay, well, looks like I'm gonna have to cheat this. I wasn't expecting to be able to pull out my own arc reactor. It's more of a gimmick for people to, you know, try out for themselves while I'm wearing the suit. Grab that, stuff that in there. It should boot up in just a second. And slip the arm back on. <laughs> oh, it still hasn't turned on, that's weird. Oh, there we go. This arc reactor in particular is running on an ATtiny85 board. It seems to take a real long time to boot up and turn on, but for the next arc reactor I'll be building for this suit, it'll be a completely different system. That'll be coming out next month. I'm really excited. I'll be sharing the files for it. Should be pretty cool, but yeah. So the arc reactor is in, it's illuminated. I'm wearing the entire suit. The only thing I'm missing right now and I'm currently printing is the neck and the rest of the helmet. The gloves I already have printed, I just haven't had the chance to assemble them. But yeah, the suit is basically ready to go. There's no inherent flaws or any red flags coming up. I think I'm ready to start disassembling this thing and starting to sand and paint it. 
This is so cool. Dude, this is wicked. Then let's do the ailerons one more time, just so you guys can see into the light. So I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or suggestions about my Mark 46 cosplay, please leave them in the comments down below. And a big thank you again to PCBWay for sponsoring the channel and to Sunloo for sponsoring this Mark 46 cosplay. And I really hope to see you all in the next one.